So uh, let me start first uh, with who am I? And uh, my name is Alexander Fedorova, and uh, my IRC nickname is Book War, and maybe you can see me in some other places under this nickname. So I'm a long-term Fedora ambassador, and formerly I worked in uh, Mirantis OpenStack distribution, managing releases of a uh, distribution itself and a full component of it. And currently I'm working as continuous integration engineer at Trivago. And as no one knows what continuous integration engineer is, uh, that's the person who tries to make sure that uh, development workflows fit into, uh, fit into the deployment workflows you use in production. So I'm kind of trying to help developers and admins to find the communication way, the way to communicate and to uh, improve on these integration pipelines. So if you have questions, comments, and discussions, want to discuss something, then uh, you can find me today and tomorrow at Fedora booth. You can write me and you can comment on my small blog at Medium. So today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, but um, mainly uh, let me explain the subtitle. So the Obviously, this talk is uh, very entry level and it's totally not enough for managing Kubernetes cluster or for like uh, real working with, with it. But uh, what I meant by this um, title is that whenever you are a developer or sysadmin or even product manager or product owner, you need a certain base level uh, how you uh, how Kubernetes works so you will be able to talk with people about Kubernetes and the work and the services. So this uh, talk presents a safe minimum for anyone who's going to work around this topic and uh, I hope you will enjoy it. So yeah, we are going to talk about containers and Kubernetes and as I'm a CI engineer, I want to give a bit of a context and start from the very beginning. Uh, and first the question to the audience, who works with Docker? Awesome. And who works with Kubernetes? Awesome as well. <laughs> cool. So uh, I'm going to start with very, very basic stuff. Uh, what are containers and what are VMs? There's a lot to talk about, but uh, mainly for purpose of, from the point of developer who created his op application or just from a very generic high level point of view. Virtual machine has its own kernel process. Uh, container uses the host kernel from uh, uses kernel from the host, and this is the main difference in the organization of containerized and virtualized processes. So uh, this main difference leads us to first note that containers are generally not secure and. Uh, as our container user space has direct access to host, host kernel, that's definitely a not secure situation and you can uh, execute code on a host system from a container, generally. There are more to the topic, but this is observation number one and observation number two are just that containers are generally weird. It's uh, promised by container uh, developers, the uh, um, like evangelists of container systems that containers are cross-platform, easy to uh, move from one system to another, but generally you always need to have in mind that containers are, uh, represent a very hybrid operating system. You take arbitrary kernel, you add arbitrary user space, and you hope that it will work. It, <laughs> it generally does, but not always. So, um, the generic takeaways I would like to point for like general overview of, for a container is that first of all, uh, used only trusted sources and uh, still never trust user in the, inside the container unless you invest a lot of uh, resources into researching the container security topics. And I guess there will be talk about container security right uh, after the lunch here maybe. And uh, as we have this uh, kernel and user space discrepancy, uh, we shouldn't rely really on kernel or system level features 
in a container. Uh, generally, uh, it, it usually container applications are the uh, essentially user space applications like web frontends or um, generic services, but um, the thing is it's impossible to not rely at least on some kernel features even if you are a high-level application developer. So there was a recent example with PHP 7 a container where everything broke because of a different kernel on the host system because PHP 7 relies on a certain implementation of random numbers and when you work with random numbers this leads us to kernel implementation of random numbers and there was a bug on container of PHP 7 application which wasn't able to run on recent Fedora for example just because the kernel was different. So even if you're an application developer, you are not safe and you might get into issues with different kernels. And so every time you work with containers, you should test containers in the same host system which you will use in production. They, like develop in any system you want, do what you want, but before you push it to the real life production system, you should always test it on the same kind of host system even if you hope this is a cross-platform application. Now, <coughs> containers are all good and nice, and uh, basically container technology was, uh, has been around uh, for 10 years or more. But uh, here comes Docker, and uh, what Docker adds to containerization, I think, first of all, Docker just appeared in the right time when container technology becomes mature enough to be properly used. But Docker also adds a lot of uh, stuff around, uh, like around the container technology itself. So Docker adds an ecosystem to manage containers, to work with them, and uh, to share them, and so on. So for, uh, again, for our high-level overview, Docker can be considered as a way of managing a layered, uh, layered images for containers. So container technology is one thing, but Docker adds a sort of a Git repository for containers. And uh, again, uh, this one thing uh, which is useful for uh, application developers is to understand the layering structure of Docker images because it's often uh, people consider Docker as just an isolation mechanism and uh, a sharing uh, mechanism, but they forget about internal layering structure. And uh, with these layers, it becomes uh, really ugly sometimes when you have huge images which contain basically nothing. Uh, like in this example, you can see that this is uh, uh, container which is used mostly for uh, building Java apps. And you see that uh, we have a Docker file uh, which is the recipe for a container image. And we start from a base layer, we add layer one, which is a layer with a Gradle binary. And uh, we add layer two, which is layer with protobuf compiler. And you can see that uh, this um, Docker file is a bit looks looks a bit weird because I do apt get update and apt get clean several times. But the reason for that is again that every instruction creates a certain layer, and this layer you will keep with you uh, whenever you move one container from one system to another. So you always want to have your layers as minimal as possible. Thus, if you use apt get for example, you always need to clean cache in the same instruction where you updated it so you don't carry it with you because you don't need it ever. And uh, with these uh, layered images, as I said, Docker kind of creates the git for containers. There's of course more to it which Docker adds. Docker adds networking, Docker adds volumes, and uh, you can mount directories from a host system in a container, you can create shared volumes and so on. So there is more to the topic, but generally uh, for the purpose of this 
kind of talk, you can safely think that Docker is la layering and uh, everything else can be added later. Now, uh, once you have these containers, then you have a way to store and share and reuse them. Now, uh, containers become a way to package software and to deliver it. And uh, I want to put this a bit in the context how the continuous integration with containers can look like. So mainly containers uh, are used in continuous integration uh, in, a very, in two very different distinct ways. So one way you use container in CI is that this is your built environment, the build tool, and generally you have this Git repository with your source code, you have an application artifact which we want to produce, and you have your built infrastructure environment like dependencies, tool chain, uh, all related uh, stuff to the build process. And you can, like, old school way of managing it by installing this on a worker slaves is really hard to maintain because uh, every application now the nowadays requires its own environment and if we don't want to agree on the common baseline for using some dependencies and so on. So container image in CI is very helpful to solve this problem. You put your, all your dependencies, build cache, git cache, dependency cache, all in container image and then you can uh, safely use it to build this particular application, uh, create the application artifact, push the artifact to storage, and then you can just discard the container and uh, never uh, use it again. But this is just one application of a continu containers, which is very, very helpful on the infrastructure level, but this is not enough. So as soon uh, as we go further with containers, we want to use containers in production. And here, this is a critically different uh, container kind of container because here we use our application code as, an as a source and we build container image as an artifact as a result of our continuous integration, continuous delivery process and this uh, container image is our production artifact. So uh, the pipeline which builds this kind of container images is completely different. It has different uh, way of uh, approval of changes, like if your build tools uh, have more libraries than needed, or if your build tools fail by some reason, you don't care. If it's production container, then there's much more to it, you need much better testing, you need much better storage, and so on. So the life cycle, uh, life cycle of a certain application can look like this. Uh, you have a, your source code, you put, your, put it in Git repository, hopefully, and then you take the code from a Git repo, you do some building, you produce an artifact. In my case, this is a jar. You publish jar to your repository again. This is a Maven repository, for example. Then you take your jar, you build your uh, Docker image containing this jar, you publish this Docker image to Docker registry. And this image in that Docker registry is your final artifact which goes to production environment. And here there are two containers I were talking about. So for uh, Gradle build, uh, you use this build container for CI, which is your disposable container with all your build tools. And for uh, the final artifact, there is a container for production, which is totally different from the one you use for building. So currently there's a lot of issues when people try to uh, merge the, both the, those containers into one, and this is why Docker, for example, cre uh, invented the format uh, which is, I cannot remember how it's properly called, but currently you can have a, basically two uh, stages in a Docker file, the build stage and the production, uh, the, like, uh, production stage. But I prefer to have this as a completely two different Docker files and different, manage it differently, build differently, maintain differently. <coughs> so now we have come to the registry with our Docker images and like we obviously want to run our application in production. And here is where the fun starts. 
because you, continuous images are not enough, you need to understand how many of those processes with these continuous images you run, how they interact, how to update them, how to roll out, how to roll back, how to reschedule to different hosts, and so on. And this is where the Kubernetes comes into our discussion because Kubernetes is an orchestration platform. This is taken from the Kubernetes main site, so it's kind of a mission statement for Kubernetes project. So uh, the whole idea of Kubernetes project is to operate those, uh, or orchestrate those uh, container, containers and container images we uh, have produced in the previous step. And Kubernetes is a whole new thing because it, it is a platform which provides a certain framework uh, in which you want to dig in. And uh, continue, uh, Kubernetes has a lot of uh, helpful objects and abstractions which uh, are uh, helpful for you as a admin or developer or anyone. But uh, this means also that it has a lot of new terms and the whole new language you need to learn before you start working with it. And uh, this is the some, some of the main um, terms uh, in the Kubernetes uh, setup, which uh, like everyone who's working with Kubernetes must learn and must know, because like this is the language you use to describe what you're doing with this orchestration cluster. So obviously we have this image uh, with, a, uh, uh, with our application, the image is stored in a registry. Now we have a container, container runs images, some, some, some containers can run the same image, some containers run different. Now we have this new term which is pod, and this is basically just a group of containers. And we have a node which is a host system for pods. Node is mean, you can imagine it's a bare metal host or a virtual machine, it can be anything. It can be virtual machine in OpenStack, it can be bare metal, it can be Amazon instance. And uh, obviously you have this Kubernetes cluster as a set of nodes. And then you have these three more abstractions which we are going into details later. So just this is uh, the layout of a Kubernetes cluster and gen generic layout how, how it looks like. So we have cluster, multiple <coughs> nodes, every node has different, uh, po uh, has a lot of pods, every pod has a lot of containers. Uh, generally, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between pod and container, and we probably will see why is that. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the layout of these objects, and now we uh, like putting the objects in this kind of layout is one thing, but now you need to work with this, and this is where the management abstractions come come into uh, into come in. <laughs> So how do you manage pods? So from Kubernetes points of view, Kubernetes never works with individual containers. Uh, it always works with uh, predefined groups of containers. So we, we just don't, are not interested in uh, managing container uh, alone. We always have this a set of containers which we put in a pod. And uh, it's uh, cool, uh, I mean, uh, it's, most common case, there is one container per pod, and me, this means that pod is just a wrapper uh, uh, object around the, your one base application container. So first, uh, when you start with, uh, to work with uh, pods and containers, the first uh, uh, notion you need to know is the replica set. So a replica set is when you define a certain application, you want to go make microservices, obviously, everyone wants to. And uh, uh, you want, uh, you, you never want uh, one container with one application, you want a set of them. And this, called, uh, this is called replica set. A replica set has a counter. The number of uh, con uh, containers which belong to this replica set, all of them, all of, uh, number of pods, all of those pods are equal. This is just the scaling of one pod into multiple uh, multiple components. So here in this example, we have a Nginx container, which it's put into Nginx pod. And this pod is a member, every pod is a member of replica set for Nginx. And uh, the replica counter here is four. So main, uh, like, 
main, option, main property of a replica set uh, in a Kubernetes cluster is that the replica set can be scaled up and scaled down. So uh, re replica counter is a parameter which can be changed during the uh, lifetime of a replica set. And Kubernetes will deal with scheduling this new pod to some node, which if, if it finds that uh, if you uh, increase the replica counter, Kubernetes scheduler will find a way to run one more uh, pod of the same kind uh, on some of the nodes. So scheduling is uh, done by Kubernetes, everything is done by Kubernetes, you just basically set this replica number to plus one. But um, having replica sets is cool, but uh, it manages like the number of pods, but it doesn't touch the content of pods. So once you define the replica set, you define the content of a pod, and then you just scale up, scale down. That's all, all you do with this um, object. So um, there's uh, one more thing uh, which you need once you start working with replica sets, as again, as we are going to scale up, scale down, we obviously want, uh, we don't just scale up, scale down for, for the fun of it, we uh, want to load balancing of a certain service onto many instances of the application. We, that's the reason why we scale. So uh, that's why here comes one more concept, which is the concept of a service. Service is a common endpoint for a replica set. It can be a common endpoint for one replica set, but you can also can uh, have several replica sets under the umbrella of a certain service. You even, uh, there are more to it, you can have services based on certain selectors. So you can uh, have, uh, you can choose pods by some label and uh, assign service to them. So. There is a flexible tool, so mainly service is a uh, yeah, common endpoint for the group of pods and which are in replica sets. So in this example, I have two replica sets with different version of Nginx application inside, and I have a common, um, common service uh, assigned to them. Now, uh, so we have replica sets, we have service. So we can scale uh, replicas, service will be adjusted accordingly. So everything is done automatically by Kubernetes. Once you add more uh, stuff into your replica set, service will include them as well. But again, this is not, not enough. You need a way to update your content of your pods. And this is where deployment object comes because deployment object, it means you add an update strategy to your replica sets. So, uh, Obviously, you can do everything manually. You can set up your replica set. You can uh, set up the second replica set with engines of version two, and you can migrate your workload from one to another. But Kubernetes is good because it all it's already does everything for you, and you don't need to care. So deployment object uh, manages updates for replica sets. So in this example, I have uh, deployment object Jinx. Uh, which was at first uh, set up as a deployment object with a replica set with Jinx version 1. But then I want to roll out new Jinx version 2. I set up the roll, roll out uh, update pr process uh, in Kubernetes and then Kubernetes takes care so it creates the second replica set with second version. It starts to scale uh, down the first replica set by one by one so uh, it cuts one pod from uh, old replica set and adds one pod to the new replica set and keeps uh, service uh, working uh, to both replica sets in between. So it just uh, replaces one replica set by another uh, steadily, one by one, and keeping uh, everything in, in working state uh, in the meantime. So deployment object has a uh, higher level abstraction which uh, provides this wrapping around the updates of replica sets for you. So now uh, it was all good and abstract, but uh, now we come to more interesting tasks, which are the networking. So we have pods, we have services, we have applications, how we talk to each other. So the basic difference of um, the uh, Kubernetes, if you compare it with Docker Swarm and usual Docker network, is that in Kubernetes uh, you have one 
flat network internally and every pod you have there is connected to this network and has its own IP address there. So you don't have uh, this problem of port numbers overlapping between different applications and services because every service, every pod uh, has a, its own IP address assigned to it by the Kubernetes scheduler and thus you have a freedom as an application developer, as a creator of those pods and containers to, expo to use any kind of port you want. If, it doesn't matter if one, the developer sitting next to you wants to use the port 80, he can, uh, because uh, you will use, obviously you will use different IP addresses and everyone has uh, the whole range of ports available. So there is external network of which your nodes are connected to and there is a flat internal network where pods live. And by default, these networks are not in any way not, in, not connected. I mean, uh, no, this is not true exactly. Uh, so pods can access the internet usually. But uh, they, uh, from, from outside, if the question is how do you access the pods? Yeah? If there is just an internal network, there are some IP ranges, IP addresses, but no one knows how to reach the, uh, the, the, those IP addresses from the outside. So um, before we get into that, uh, we uh, should think about services first. So uh, how does load balancing work with this services mechanism? So uh, in Kubernetes, uh, we, there is ser every service has a virtual IP address assigned to it. So it, it is not a uh, DNS entry as it often happens. Uh, this is not a DNS because um, DNS is too slow in delivering the updates, basically. For Kubernetes, updating service uh, endpoints and IP addresses happen uh, very fast and DNS is not reliable enough uh, for uh, this kind of microservices operations uh, to deliver fast updates uh, of IP addresses. That's why it was decided that um, services in Kubernetes are represented as a virtual IP addresses and there is a routing uh, created uh, on IP tables level for services to balance uh, requests to the uh, backend endpoints, which are pods uh, of current service. So this, again, internally, every service has its own personal IP address from the IP range, and uh, it, every pod can access a service by IP address or by name. But now we want to reach there from the outside, and uh, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, mainly, yeah, you, you need to route the traffic from outside through the, some node interface to internal network. So uh, this is called on the Kubernetes terms, exposing a service to uh, outside and you can expose the service as a different, in a different ways, but most basically uh, there's a, a service can be exposed as node port so what it means, you uh, choose a certain port on a, in a range and uh, then uh, you assign this port to a certain service and then every node in your cluster ev uh, will have this port opened and redirected to this internal service inside Kubernetes. So you kind of uh, uh, don't have an IP address here, you have just a port. So every service represented as a port on, on, on the node and uh, you can access any node with this port to get to the same service. Uh, obviously accessing uh, services via ports is not fun. You don't want to remember these ports by names. So Kubernetes has uh, connectors to different cloud systems. For example, if you have Kubernetes platform deployed on AVS or on Google Cloud, then it can uh, talk with Google API or uh, AVS uh, API. And w once you create internally this service, this service will be registered in AVS API. And uh, AVS will create a, a rule which will uh, route this traffic uh, to a certain port, again, on the cluster and route to this service. So you don't uh, want to have your 
client services to discover your services by port, you will discover them by name, and Amazon will do, or Google, or your like certain bare metal uh, hosted system, like console, can do that for you. But generally, the underlying concept is the same, so each node exposes a port, port is mapped to a service. Now, uh, there's more to it, but I want to go to, yeah, I want to go to the more client-related stuff here. Uh, so, uh, these were abstract com concepts, but how do you work with them really in your like daily life? So, Kubernetes has a kubectl command. This is a common line, ut common line utility. It is very extremely verbose because it's kind of wrapper around the full REST API of a Kubernetes cluster. So every object is represented in this command line utility and you can get objects, you can like list objects, describe them, update them and so on. So this is a uh, kind of a REST API handler. And uh, while you can uh, create all objects through command line by running some uh, kubectl commands, you obviously don't want to do that all the time, manually typing all the options there. So uh, all your object descriptions can be stored in YAML files, and these YAML files can be consumed by kubectl, or they can be consumed like on a, uh, it's also possible to have a JSON format, but generally uh, you have a repository with your YAML configurations, and then you just apply this, the whole folder of your YAML configurations to the cluster to do uh, anything there. There is also a Kubernetes dashboard interface. This is a graphical web interface which provide you, provides you with an uh, overview of what you have, which nodes you have, which uh, pods you have, how this is all going. But uh, this web interface, again, it's a wrapper around the same REST API, but it has limited functionality, so kubectl should be your main option once, once you really work with it. And Kubernetes dashboard is an option for just having a generic overview. Now, uh, this is two examples. Uh, how do you work with kubectl tool from command line? So, for example, uh, kubectl run command by default creates those deployment objects we talked about. So I set this replicas uh, number to the number I want to have this starting number of, of my pods. I set the image uh, because, uh, like as I said, the default option is to have one container per pod, and this is what is handled here. If I set up this, specify this one image, I will have a pod created for it, and I have five instances of it created. And then I, I simply expose this uh, deployment object to the outside world. Uh, here I'm specifying the internal port on my application. My application is listened by some reason to port 5000. And I uh, expose this to the outside world. I don't choose which node port I'm exposing this uh, service on because Kubernetes will take care of it. So I don't uh, have a problem of overlapping uh, ports again. So the idea is that uh, you create your deployment objects, your services, your service accounts, and everything you need. As a user of this cluster, you shouldn't be interrupted by another user who already have this port busy. That's why you don't choose here which node port you will use. Kubernetes will fi find it and will uh, register the service to it. Then you will be able to discover this port or your Amazon API or Google API will create this rule so you will access service by name and this port will be somewhere behind. You don't care which one exactly port it is. So uh, every time there is, there is a, uh, this uh, feature that you don't uh, overlap with other people's work, so you have a full independent uh, application, fully independent applications don't clash in with each other, don't take in each other's uh, ports and, and, and IP addresses. And uh, one more thing is that this networking is uh, not easy, uh, and uh, 
the networking you see from the outside is different from the networking setup you see from inside. And uh, this is a um, very huge difference, yeah, because from outside you get this port uh, mapping and uh, the, a lot of translations in between. So sometimes you just want to know what's going on in the internal network and what's happening. Can pods talk to each other without going outside? And that's uh, where debugging pod is helpful. Uh, you can create a simple pod uh, just with one container, temporary, so it's not a part of a huge deployment object. It's not a part of a replica set. It's just uh, one pod with one image, which is run temporarily, and as soon as you close uh, the process, it, uh, it gets killed and uh, removed from a cluster. But this uh, kind of uh, debugging pod provides you the way to interactively uh, get into the uh, internal network. So you run it from your uh, desktop, laptop, workstation, you get inside, uh, you, you trigger this, um, uh, some debugging pod. In my example, it's a busy box, but busy box is actually a bad uh, thing to use as a debugging pod because it has no nice tools to which you need to debug. So basically you need to create a debugging image with like tools like TCP dump, nmap, curl, get, and so on. So you have your, uh, admin toolbox in this uh, container image. When you run this container image, you get your interactive uh, command line from inside this image, and then you all can work on internal network through this image and investigate what's going on there. Uh, of course, there is uh, much more to the topic, uh, and there is uh, like I covered. I covered only the. Uh, most common uh, deployment object because this is the first object you start working it with. Then there's uh, as well daemon sets which allow you, for example, to deploy pods, uh, at least one pod per node. So if you want a service which should be local to each, uh, to each node, you can uh, set up a special scheduling uh, Algorithm so the pods will be scheduled in such a way so every node in your cluster will have at least one instance of a pod of this type. You can have stateful sets, you can have more volumes, you can have jobs, you can have uh, config maps and secrets, which means config maps is a, uh, just things you can store in, into, in the internal Kubernetes cluster storage uh, uh, and uh, they can be added to your container. So you can have some configuration options stored as a file, keep this file in, in the Kubernetes cluster itself, and uh, let containers use this file uh, on the fly. And you can update this file and containers will get it updated and so on. You can have the same but for secrets with additional uh, safety measures. You can have service accounts which are like, uh, again, your <coughs> pod can use certain authentication methods uh, which are stored on the Kubernetes level and so on. So Kubernetes uh, adds more and more abstraction, uh, abstract objects to help you with uh, solving those typical tasks so you don't do this stuff on your own. But yeah, we can start with basics and dig from there. So um, basically, this was uh, my all content. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask now. Anything interesting? Yeah? What do you think about running databases? <laughs> 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 okay. Um, uh, yeah, the, the question was what I'm thinking about running databases in uh, Kubernetes. So I don't think about it. <laughs> uh, the main reason, um, like, uh, yeah, obviously databases are a completely different use case from a common stateless microservices. And if you really need to run them in a Kubernetes, you maybe should try, but uh, I think this is a way out of the scope of what Kubernetes provides currently. So for me, the Kubernetes, as you probably saw from the talk, how I frame it, uh, it's a, uh, Kubernetes is a platform for deployment pipeline, where your deployment pipeline comes to. 
And uh, it's very useful when you have those on hundreds of applications, the development teams working on them in, uh, in independently, and everyone can manage their stuff, and you can test it properly, and so on. So this is a very nice platform to solve all your integration deployment tasks. But uh, it doesn't add anything in case of a database management, from my point of view, at least now. So uh, no, I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Um, what do you think about One moment. Kubernetes for a different application area? Uh, is, uh, what do you think about using uh, Kubernetes for a different application area, a classical one, like having uh, classical containers, LXC containers or similar, and Ansible or Puppet inside a stateful approach, not a stateless as yours with uh, mm -hmm. Docker? and uh, in order to marry these both worlds. Okay, take it back. Uh, to be honest, uh, like there are a lot of stuff happening in Kubernetes world, so we cannot even imagine where we'll end up in, in two years. There might be very many different applications of the, of the, the Kubernetes approach, but uh, from my side, as a continuous integration engineer, not, not the low-level uh, maybe sysadmin, I see a lot of benefit of using Kubernetes kind of API uh, with different backends. So extending, uh, having the, this Kubernetes concept of replica sets, deployment objects, um, service accounts, management uh, tools, but replacing the backend to different kind of in implementation, be it Docker, be it VMs, be it process on a host. Why not? Yeah, so this is also could be uh, nice and interesting because like, we are really eager for that uh, way of managing our deployments and way of giving developers a way to manage these deployments. But we are flexible in terms of how exactly this is implemented on a, a base base level. Yeah. Any plans on this? <laughs> From my side, no. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Yep. I'll there repeat. One part in that question. Uh, maybe you use the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll just. I thought I was loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> but it's for recording as well. Uh, there was one uh, part in that question. Can you handle stateful images? Uh, yes, Kubernetes uh, has this concept of stateful sets, which is the way of handling uh, stateful images. But it's uh, from what I remember, it's in the early stage of development. I mean, it was it appeared in, in 1.6 release or something like this year. So I don't know the current like production readiness for this kind of setup, and I've never heard about this kind of uh, production readiness. But maybe it's just me. So I'm not exactly the expert in this particular topic because for the purpose of our setup, we have very nice microservices friendly internal project, which is like really tru truly stateless and can connect to the database, which is remote and, and live separately. So I haven't dig into this topic. I heard that there's stateful sets, but I never use them. Yep. <laughs> Give it to her. <laughs> uh, do you have experience with the amount of uh, needed uh, Kubernetes cluster in a company? So we currently have them set up on AWS where we create for each uh, pro, pro project uh, one Kubernetes cluster for, for test environment and staging and one for production. So we have, uh, for example, then 20 to 30 Kubernetes cluster. Uh, other way of thinking is maybe to create just one or two really big Kubernetes cluster with a really huge amount of nodes. So. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I think that splitting up these workloads to different clusters is a better way to go. Uh, I mean, even uh, for kind of uh, just development uh, for different teams, I would have different clusters to, for them to play with because uh, they will have a flexibility and they don't f break each other's stuff this way. So uh, I believe in, in many clusters 
because I believe that um, this uh, YAML approach to Kubernetes cluster configuration is very helpful in this way. So you can migrate your configurations from one cluster to another easily. So unless you really need the interaction between these uh, projects, why do you put them in one, one place? So once you have this infrastructure as a code approach, you just uh, create your clusters as you need them and, and use them. That's uh, what I think about it. So let me clarify maybe because uh, <laughs> from the questions I heard, uh, so currently uh, we are working on our uh, like new greenfield projects. We are digging in, so we are not maybe that experienced as you, for example. So we, this is our uh, how we look into it and how we plan to do this. Maybe like in one year you will ask me and I'll say, no, it's completely different and this is a different way. But uh, for, for now, yeah, this is the way I would go. Um, what's what's the overhead of um, deploying a Kubernetes cluster? How much resources does it need to just do nothing and sit there? Uh, this is a good question, which I cannot answer you right now. Uh, this is something we need to investigate more on our setup. So, uh, like, just to imagine, to have a understanding. Uh, no, I don't. I don't have numbers. With me right now. So um, it's also a question to the auditorium. Yeah, yeah. My the reason why I was asking my first question. <laughs> <laughs> because we have because we have experience that uh, always creating a new cluster for some environment just eats up a lot of resources. Expensive. Yeah, of course it will be ex more expensive. Uh, the thing is, uh, like, what's more expensive, the cluster resources or the resources of the developers who will work on this setup. And this is always the trade-off, yeah? You can go very effective hardware-wise, but then your developers will struggle, and then, like, your effectiveness doesn't bring you that much. So what uh, we have, uh, what our experience is, what you need. So when we have a setup in AWS, for example, and you need a uh, high available setup, so you have these master nodes, which are used to control the Kubernetes cluster, and then you want to spread the nodes over the AZs, over the av availability zones, so you have um, um, then on our setup three uh, uh, master nodes for each cluster and then the worker nodes and even the worker nodes are sp split over the availability zones so we have always a setup with um, three um, master nodes and three uh, worker nodes that's our minimal uh, setup and what you can where you can uh, work with especially when you have such a cloud setup is uh, um, how you size the nodes so for example when you have just a development cluster you can take smaller um, uh, EC2 instances than, for example, for production. And then, of course, you can scale up and down, but uh, especially for this um, high availability setup, you need uh, minimum spread at the uh, nodes over the availability zones. Yep. Um, my question is also about the scalability because I had some experiences with Kubernetes and for my setup uh, I also used uh, three nodes but I have had a problem so I don't like the scalability of Kubernetes because as soon as one pr uh, node of this three breaks down the containers are not scheduled about uh, 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 across the uh, different servers which are still running so as soon as run etcd uh, instance break down from my my whole uh, uh, cluster or the at least the services from the one were down and they were not scheduled back to the other nodes uh, that's not true <laughs> i mean that if this happens in your setup this obviously is a bug because this is the idea of kubernetes cluster if your one node goes down you have your rescheduling of the pods uh, to the other available nodes so probably... Like yes, as, as, as soon as I had four, it was, of course, scaled down to three. But as soon as it was going under three, it didn't scale. Uh, so I had to, to at least three running nodes uh, to have the high availability. That's... 
an interesting topic to discuss. Like, are you sure it's not? It wasn't because you just resources were not available on those remaining nodes, and you as, as soon as one etc did an instance breakdown from the. Uh, okay, then uh, whereas uh, like ETCD services can be also clusterized in different ways, so it might depend on your setup, on you might dig into it because uh, like obviously it's not designed to work this way, and obviously the idea is that once you have this high available cluster, you can take uh, out the ETCD node. And uh, I had the deployment of Kubernetes done by Cube Spray. Uh, which it was cargo project recently, but now it's Cube Spray, and uh, I tested this uh, killing of one of the master nodes, and it uh, was recovering, and it worked for me. So we can think about how it, how how it was. Yeah. And another question uh, was, um, how can I set up a uh, Kubernetes uh, on my local laptop? So as I'm, uh, I'm working as a developer on the run, um, how can I set up? Mm -hmm. Environment here and can test deployment and things that's, like that. That's an awesome question because I almost forgot to tell you about it. Uh, so uh, one thing Docker uh, added to, I think, the development environment generally is that uh, now people start to care about the onboarding of new people rather than just inventing, uh, in, uh, developing the technology itself. So Kubernetes project learned its lesson from Docker and created a lot of documentation, a lot of tooling around to help people to get on board because like, it appears that it's very important. So now there's this mini kube tool. Uh, you can uh, download it from, Git, uh, from GitHub and uh, this is uh, the mini kube looks like, okay, I need to have some link, but I, I... so there is this mini kube tool which you can download. This mini cook tool allows you to set up your own developer sandbox with Kubernetes. So uh, it's a very easy uh, setup of uh, uh, like what it does under the hood. It goes to Google, fetches the VM image, downloads it to your local instance, set up your, uh, run this virtual image, and this virtual image internally contains the Kubernetes cluster. This is a one node cluster, so it's not a development uh, production ready Kubernetes setup, but it's a full cluster with services which you can use as a developer to test stuff, to run these replica sets, to run pods, and to, deal, to play with the Kubernetes cluster. So I have it running, and I think this is even works. Sometimes, and uh, you can uh, see that uh, it's Kubernetes. Uh, this mini kube uh, utility automatically configures your authentication uh, locally, so that your kube CTL uh, tool starts to work with this mini kube cluster. So it, uh, you can see that I can access this cluster with kube CTL utility. I can also try to look into into dashboard of this particular uh, mini kube instance. So you can see that I have only one node. This is a this VM uh, which mini kube uh, downloaded. I have a, uh, some deployment objects. Actually, this is a one deployment object running here and uh, with five instances and uh, yeah, I probably can see the pods here, the five pods running on this Kubernetes cluster. And uh, so this mini kube is like full Kubernetes here on your laptop. You, you work with the API and the things you do with this API, you store them in YAML files, you go to your production cluster, upload the same YAML files and get the same result. Obviously, mm, uh, not on the multi-node uh, level, because this is only one node we have, but we, you can test the deployment strategies, you can see how updates is roll, rolled out one by one, and, and so on. So look, as a playground for developers, this is an awesome tool. Anything else? What are ingresses? <laughs> Sorry. What are ingresses? So, uh, 
Ingress is a way to uh, route the traffic not by uh, port alone, but by rules. So you can assign a set of rules and say if some, basically HTTP rules. Uh, you can uh, create this proxy on a s uh, level of uh, like virtual host level. If you specify different virtual hosts, if you specify different, virtu uh, different paths, they will be routed to different services. So it's a, Ingress is the next level of a, uh, node port. Uh, wh when you wrap around uh, the node port and you uh, do the routing on a more rich, uh, with richer rules now, nowadays. Yep. Uh, it's uh, it's not a replacement for DNS. It's re it's a, basically it's a proxy uh, of a, a seventh level po proxy. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Yeah, so I hope you got interested and will try this Minikube stuff uh, at home and uh, enjoy how easy it is to live with it uh, because, yeah, it's really like a very nice uh, tool to work with. Of course, this is not the... the uh, Problemless tool, there are complications, and uh, this is just the tip of an iceberg, and as I said, this, uh, the content of a talk just helps to get you on board. Then, like, there is a lot to learn, and for me as well, it's just uh, we have just started with this journey. And, uh, yeah, as I said, there are questions, discussions, and we're obviously hiring, so if you're interested, come talk to me. Thanks.